are now recording, so we are live. Thank you all so much for joining us, those of you who have hopped in. Um, we are glad to have you. And you are all uh, in the webinar as attendees, which means that your video is, um, is turned off and your sound is muted, uh, and you should just see us as panelists. Um, our plan is to have a 45-minute presentation from Bob Gale, who is Mountain True's Ecologist and Public Lands Director invasive species and how those show up and are treated within the uh, forest management plan, the draft forest management plan. And after he presents, we will have live Q&A. Um, in the meantime, you are welcome to submit questions using the Q&A feature that you should be able to find at the bottom of your screen. If you scroll your mouse down to the bottom of the Zoom window, um, you should see um, the option to open up a Q&A panel that would pop up as a new window. And you can type questions into there. We have Callie Moore, who is our Western Regional Director, also on this webinar, and she will be um, fielding managing questions as they come in and either sending them to Bob to answer live or typing in responses into that Q&A box. Um, so if she doesn't answer you right away, then sit tight and we will get to it uh, at the end, perhaps. At the very end of this webinar, uh, there will be a browser window open on your screen that should have the Mountain True Forest Plan comment page on it where you can see the Mountain True's full analysis of the draft plan and also submit your official comments to the Forest Service right from that page. So that should be live. Um, I believe that is all I have. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Bob, to show us your presentation. Okay. Um, and let me see, get, get that share up on the screen there. Um, we can see it. It says I'm sharing, um, but I'm not, uh, I've got to get mine showing somehow. You might need to navigate over to the browser window that has your presentation on it. But we are, we are still looking at that first slide of yours. Okay, that's good. I'll, uh, Try to find that. There we go. Um, okay. Uh, and yep, good. Okay, folks. Um, I have uh, prepared a little slideshow here uh, to talk about um, this issue of non-native invasive plants with regard to the forest plan. Um, I have. I'll move over to this slide. It's a little better to look at. Um, basically what I'm going to be going over are a background on uh, invasive plants and regarding public lands uh, and, and a, the federal government agencies kind of thing, sort of a historical perspective. Um, I'm going to go over ecological impacts of invasives uh, briefly because I find when I go and talk to anyone, there's the presentation, the, the um, uh, knowledge of people is all across the board from not knowing anything to knowing a fair amount. Um, so hopefully uh, this will just help give you a uh, little more information. Um, then I'm going to talk about the draft plan proposal regarding um, non-native invasives and then our concerns and recommendations. I have a little bit of a, I have a fairly short number of slides, so I have a little extra uh, gem at the end if we need the time, if we have the time. Um, I've got six slides that I will actually uh, go into detail about six six of our worst invasive plants. Um, but if we don't have time for that, that's no problem. Uh, we'll just see how this goes. Um, I also have um, overlain uh, or put in the background of all of this a composite of all the invasive, um, non-native invasive plants that we have in our area. And so it will be a faint background, hopefully not too confusing, but sort of provides a backdrop to all this. And at the same time, I've added some um, clear photos of some of our gems that we see when we go out hiking and all in our mountains. So, um, with that, I'll try trying to go to the next slide here. There we go. Uh, so the background, invasive species have been here for a long time. And when we say invasive species, uh, we can be talking about anything from insects to mammals to reptiles to plants, uh, you name it. Uh, but for the purposes of this, this uh, presentation, we're gonna be talking about invasive plants. 
um, the picture featured here is actually the result of an invasive plant that was killed by a non-native invasive insect. This is a several hundred year old um, a hemlock, eastern hemlock, took several hundred years to grow and in about seven years a tiny tiny insect called a hemlock woolly adelgid brought it down. Uh, one of the tragedies that's happened in our mountains. So um, invasive insects are a problem and we do uh, will be addressing them in our, our comments from Mountain True. But anyway, um, I will talk more about the plants from here on out. And I'm going to use, you're going to see the um, acronym NNIP. It just stands for Non-Native Invasive Plants. It's just hard to say that and write it a lot. So um, when you see that, just know that that's what we're talking about. Um, so, uh, the main thing is, even though invasive plants have been here a long time, they've come into the country, came into the country even on early colonial ships and all, uh, there have only been a few that have been problematic, and they've received just a single uh, focus through, the, through time. Never before have we actually talked about non-native invasive plants as a whole group. Uh, this individual focus started changing in the 1970s. And um, yours truly is one of the people, the maturing baby boomers that got out of high school and got out of college and suddenly started needing housing. And we were too much population and uh, housing demand went up, housing construction went up. The interstate highway system also came into being, um, which uh, I'll talk about why that, that's important. And a number of new highways were created to connect to all these subdivisions that were being uh, forced um, upon us. With all that, that created the great demand for landscaping. And uh, just like everybody else in my generation, uh, landscape architects proved to be very creative and looking for new ways and new fields and new ways of doing things. And they started bringing in plants from other continents uh, without any idea that that might not be a good thing. So in the 1980s, there was a growing realization of the problem. Economically, it really hit the agriculture industry where invasive plants, non-native invasives, started um, impacting agricultural crops. Uh, ecologically, scientists, botanists, uh, and, and the, the most nerdy of them that were out there seeing on the ground, um, seeing changes, realized that these plants were leaving uh, landscape yards and they were coming off of tires of uh, transportation, um, highways are corridors and vectors for moving invasive plants. And uh, so with the interstate system, we saw things going very great distances. Uh, and that all finally, the, the economics of all that and the eco ecologics, if you will, of all that started getting government attention. And so that led to in um, early 1999, President Bill Clinton issued an executive order which uh, focused on this new issue and this new problem and uh, the executive order defined the issue. It established an invasive species council which uh, involved uh, um, sec uh, cabinet members and uh, three departments were the coach heads were the co-chairs. The Department of Interior which is where our national parks uh, occur, the, the Department of Agriculture, and the Department of Commerce. Commerce because these things were crossing state lines as well as coming into the nation. Um, and uh, it also created the Invasive Species Council. It directed it to create an invasive species management plan to try to connect uh, and communicate between various agencies nationwide. Um, that was a big order, um, but it was a great thing and it really started the ball rolling. And the other thing that this uh, executive order called for, it directed federal agencies to one, prevent, prevent further introductions of non-native invasive plants, uh, to establish detection and rapid response systems when, when new ones came in, to monitor populations of the plants that were here, invasives and invasives that might be coming in or spreading, uh, and offer forms of control for that, and then it also called for restoring native species in areas where non-native invasive plants were eradicated. 
uh, we don't usually use the term eradicate too much with non-native invasives. What we use is the term control because we're not, never going to get rid of them all, but we can get rid of most of them in the areas where we focus. It actually can be done. We've been doing it for years at Mountain True for, for almost two decades. Uh, it also called for conducting non-native invasive plant research in all fields, even uh, what causes them, why they grow better in some areas or not, uh, even down to soil microbes, anything that scientists could research about them. It, it encouraged that. And then finally, it promoted public education about this issue. And has, has this worked? What's happened? Over the years, it took a long time going, going at first only the uh, agencies knew more about it and scientists um, and conservation organizations started learning about it. We got onto it early as Mountain True because I was in the landscape business for the first 15 years after college and I planted thousands of these things all over South Carolina, unfortunately. So I took a special interest and in, um, aimed Mountain True toward uh, looking into this and we've been working on it really since 2002. Uh, and so the public education has now reached a point where people mostly know that invasive plants are there and they're bad. They may not know a lot more about them, but uh, the average homeowner is now learning about them to the point where there are a number of homeowners associations and residential areas that want to get rid of the native, the non-native invasive plants that were actually designed by landscape architects for their yards. So we have reached, a, 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 we're reaching a more of a critical mass than has ever happened before. Okay, so a um, little bit of definitions needed here. Uh, Non-native, native, established, invasive, exotic. So to quote uh, Louis Armstrong and um, Ella Fitzgerald with a little humor here, you say potato, I say potato. But let's not call the whole thing off, as they said because we need to work on this issue. And so uh, let's move on a little bit here and uh, start talking about the definition. Native plant is a plant that's indigenous to an area. It naturally evolved or appeared there and has existed in the area for millennia uh, and may even hundreds of years, but often thousands. Non-native or exotic is introduced by humans locations outside of their native range. Um, this has happened deliberately. We've brought plants in for livestock forage, uh, soil retention, the classic uh, uh, poster child is kudzu, which was brought in to hold back highway steep banks when highway cuts were made on the old US highways. And we know what that did. And uh, ornamental purposes. Also, they've come in accidentally within plant containers, in shipping containers, um, in the bilge water, in, in, in ships that come into ports and they illegally dump their bilge water. We've gotten lots of aquatic invasives that way. So there's all kinds of ways these have come in and reasons. Now, an invasive plant is a plant that exhibits rapid growth over large areas and it's persistent. It has abundant seed production. Uh, it has a high germination rate. For those of you that are gardeners, you may plant uh, seeds and um, find that, gee, some of the rows of your tomatoes or onions don't, don't germinate. Well, non-native invasives seem to be very good at germinating. Um, so that's, a, that's one of their opportunistic methods. And they also have a long growing season. They leaf out quite often before any of our natives and hold their leaves longer. So they have, they're able to uh, uh, reproduce for over a longer period. And one note, we, native plants can be invasive, but uh, the reason they're invasive in most cases is because they are opportunistic at taking um, over disturbed areas. And we have been disturbing the natural uh, forests and prairies of our nation for hundreds and hundreds of years. So when, when people get mad at poison ivy, because it's growing all around their lot or along a trail or along a highway, that's because we've created the, pro the possibilities for them. Um, and in an old growth forest, you'll see a giant poison ivy vine going up a tree and all the leaves will be at the very top because that's where they're trying to get. So in the meantime, in our roadsides, we walk through them because they're searching for something to climb. 
So we've created that problem. Okay. Uh, let me get this slide to seem stuck. Oh, there we go. All right. So non-native invasive plants, putting it all together, are plants that outcompete our native plants for sunlight, space, water, and nutrients. They displace rare species, uh, rare plant species, and they alter soil characteristics and hydrologic, that is water in the ground characteristics, conditions. They interfere with natural succession, and I'll talk more about that in a bit. They reduce biodiversity by replacing complex communities which might have dozens of species with sometimes only a very few, and in some cases, a monoculture of one plant. Uh, and it is a fact in ecology that the healthiest ecosystems are those that are the most diverse. So we're, we're harming our ecosystems when we see something like this take over. One thing that has not gotten a lot of attention in all of the invasive species talks is what happens to native wildlife species. Um, these plants can alter feeding habits and literally directly harm the health of native wildlife species. We talked for a long time about how they reduce the nutrition because our native plants, our native mammals and birds and such adapted to native plants and the seeds and berries and nuts they produce over thousands of years. They get the right nutrition from them. But when it comes to uh, these non-natives, they don't get the, re the nutrition they need. They're great for uh, wildlife that lives on some other continent where the plant came from, but they're not great for our own wildlife. And there have been some cases, some kind of horror stories where um, wildlife has eaten some non-native invasives and has literally died. Uh, I won't go into a lot of detail about that now, but um, there are some pretty um, unfortunate stories uh, that have happened. And they've, this is, it's only been in the last few years that um, this has been noted. So we're still learning about non-native invasives and the problems they cause. And they go farther than we even realize. Now also, they, Non-native invasive plants can increase the susceptibility of ecosystems to other factors, such as fire or flooding or erosion. Uh, they reduce crop yields on farms. I think I mentioned something about that. And they increase herbicide use. In order to get rid of these things, there are places where in times where we have to use herbicides. There's no other way to get rid of them. Uh, and so if we allow them to continue to grow more and more, we're going to have to use more herbicides. And nobody really wants to do that. Time and money are diverted towards all of this uh, uh, invasive plant management. Um, golf courses spend lots of money fighting them. Um, farms, as we said, uh, private businesses, and um, highway, uh, highways now, uh, highway DOTs in various states are fighting some of the plants that they even planted there decades ago because nobody knew what they were going to do. And the economics are kind of all over the board. In 2004, it was estimated that they cost $6 billion. That was probably just related to agriculture. It was probably low then. More recent years, we've had some uh, uh, estimates up to $35 billion in the economic cost, which includes other areas of ecology um, that I mentioned and uh, um, public lands uh, control and that sort of thing. And I would bet anything that this figure is very, very low now. It was even within the last three years. Uh, but, but I don't think any of the estimates are really accurate. Um, OK. So I want to show you some of the, we have about 25 invasive plants that are problematic here in the mountains. And the ones in red that you can see here are still commercially available. Less and less so in local nurseries, thank goodness. They've, they've gotten the message. Um, still a lot of them in big box stores because these things come from across the nation, other states, and they're mass produced. Uh, and, um, but a lot of them, um, even those are somewhat reducing now, but a lot of these are available online. Uh, anybody can order them. So uh, th that's the problem we face now. Uh, 
I want to talk about um, some of the good things about all of this uh, federal attention and how it's affected the Forest Service. Uh, the North National Forest in North Carolina and nationwide, the U.S. Forest Service, has really increased its focus on non-native invasive plants, it's beginning in 1999 and to the present. Um, it's widely recognized, and uh, they're being uh, they're being trying to do the best they can in most most places and in most cases, given their current budgets and all. The staff, um, I can speak locally for our national force in North Carolina, but I know this is true nationwide. The staff are really knowledgeable. There are some awesome people, botanists and biologists um, and uh, aquatic biologists uh, that really know about this problem and are doing the best they can, um, given their constraints and all of their other jobs, uh, to try to um, work on this. And projects, which are generally timber projects, have increasingly involved some level of treatment. Uh, years ago, I was just screaming at the Forest Service to start paying attention to this when we, when we uh, commented on timber projects. They've definitely done a wonderful job of coming along and trying to do what they can. Uh, and the Forest Service has welcomed the public in collaboration and in, in partners helping, working on um, uh, public lands to try to reduce invasive plants, again, when they can, when they have the staff that can help coordinate, and when there are volunteer groups available. So you can't speak highly enough about all those things uh, with the Forest Service. Now, the National Forest, uh, Nanohala Pisgah Forest Plan Draft pros, there are a few. They prioritize uh, special areas, you know, areas that we like to go, scenic areas, areas we like to hike in, um, areas that have federally listed species, uh, um, uh, rare and endangered and threatened species. And they, they do try, that's where most of the work happens when it happens, to try to control these um, plants. Uh, and the plan proposes generally tier one and tier two non, uh, objectives that involve non-native invasive um, uh, work on acreage, acres of work. Uh, they also welcome in the new plan, they definitely welcome public and partner help in, in what's their tier two portion. So to, to reiterate, um, what Josh, Kelly, and Callie probably went over in, in all in previous com, um, uh, talks. Uh, the tier one are basically the things that the Forest Service has the funding and capacity to do and needs to work on. Tier two, which is something that um, the public insisted on and partners uh, insisted on, the Forest Service provides this tier two uh, in, if they can manage to get tier one objectives accomplished, um, they can do tier two also with partner help and public help. Um, but uh, those are the pros. But there are a number of concerns. Uh, the cons are that um, the tier one and two non-native invasive plant treatment and monitoring of acreage, acres are very inadequate compared to the pro proposed amount of timbering that, that's the amount of timbering being proposed. Uh, and it's a fact that uh, in a large area in the national forest, whether it's if you're looking at a timber stand uh, or a project, only a tiny part of that may be impacted by non-native invasive plants. Uh, and uh, the, the, the problem is um, not all of that is even being addressed or worked on. Um, and so the new uh, draft plan sets a low bar for the number of acres in uh, tier one and two um, that's just not adequate enough. Uh, also, the timber projects activities um, lack adequate road buffer treatment standards, um, and we'll talk about that. And they also still allow non-native plants to be used when they're planting areas for wildlife habitat enhancement. Uh, Hopefully, they're not using invasives anymore, but um, I'm not really sure about that. Um, there may be a couple that are still being uh, planted or are involved in seed mixes that suppliers just don't keep invasives out of. But uh, 
even keeping, allowing non-native plants to be planted really can have effects on our wildlife and our ecology because there are a lot of pollinators that won't even go to non-native plants. They don't recognize the flowers uh, or whatever nectar they may have or pollen. And so they aren't even doing the job of, of, of fortunately they're not spreading them, but they're also being displayed, they're, being that they're displacing our native plants, they don't have anything else to go to. And there's a lot of reasons for this, but it has also been noticed in the last few years that our insects are crashing in populations, uh, not just birds, but insects also and pollinators. Um, so there's a whole lot of reasons why we should just not allow non-native plants to be planted. Now, Mountain True's recommendations, we would like to see um, tier one increase to 2,000 acres. I, I'm sorry, I've forgotten off the top of my head where it was, but it was, um, it was close to half of that, or maybe a little more than half of that. Uh, and the same with tier two increase to 4,000 acres. We feel this is really a higher bar to set, and we have to set a higher bar. And uh, uh, to just sort of delve into that a minute, um, if you can imagine uh, uh, the idea of exponential increase, and um, to, to, to sort of paint a visual verbal picture of that, if you have a, a, a square, uh, say a one foot square, and you start putting dots in, in one corner, and double those dots, and a minute later you double them again, and again, and again, uh, eventually those dots will reach the halfway point, and then the, mat, the exponential increase happens faster and faster. If we don't start addressing invasive plants now before we get to an exponential increase uh, that's uncontrollable, we're in trouble. So uh, that's why this is very, very important to set these standards. Um, regarding roads, uh, we would like to see them develop an annual non-native invasive maintenance budget. They have no such budget, and it has become up to a point where just like mowing roads or fixing culverts, um, uh, grading roads that need regrading, it's a maintenance thing that has to become part of the permanent um, work plan, and there has to be a budget for it. Uh, regarding timber management, there are tier one and two uh, points under management itself. And we feel that timber harvest stands should be inventoried for non-native invasive plants before a project is begun. Because timbering creates a lot of disturbance. We're not opposed to it. In fact, uh, Mountain True actually supports uh, an increase in timbering from what the last plan tried, said it would do and could never do. Uh, we want to see a realistic plan with timbering in the right places for the right ecological reasons, and that can have economic benefits in timber sales. But before you do that, before you create that disturbance, you need to know if there are already invasive plants there, because if there are, that timber project then becomes a vector in itself. And we've seen this happen where invasives move into an area like that, and uh, all of a sudden, um, they're there, they're taking over. So uh, that's, that's why this is important. Um, if they're present, they need to be treated before the project and also during the life of the project. A timber project can actually extend over a period of 10 years. They used to be three years and there were smaller projects, but that was changed a number of years ago in legislation uh, and in policy. And a timber project can be started one year and some more done a few years later and some more a few years later. So if you wait to go back and see if any invasive control you did uh, for five years, you go back, you find out, well, gee, the seeds were there and they sprouted and now they've taken over again. That's not going to be helpful. Uh, project roads should be treated. The, the roads leading into a timber project, uh, for, to a timber stand where the disturbance is gonna happen, should be treated, if there are invasives there, they should be treated for 1,000 feet, we feel, before you get to the timber stand, the ingress area, 
of the road and the egress, a thousand feet past the stand. And they should have a hundred foot buffers of treatment on each side of the road. Uh, that will prevent the road is become, being a vector because if non-native invasive plants are near a timber project, they're going to get there through uh, road traffic, through the wind along the road, and through um, uh, edge species, uh, animal species that spread seeds along the road. So uh, that's why that's a very important addition we feel. And in tier two, there should be monitoring um, following a project for up to three years post project. And that, that can be done by volunteers. Um, and uh, so we feel like that is something that should be added to tier two, a, a three year time limit. I personally feel like it should be five years, but uh, to be somewhat uh, realistic, I think three years would be good. Uh, regarding wildlife management, non-native invasive plants, as I said earlier, should not be used for wildlife habitat enhancement. Now, yes, you can plant apple trees. They're not invasive, and they've, they've, we've been planting apple trees in the mountains for years, and we've got some incredible apples, uh, uh, some heritage apples, and there's a new, uh, uh, new uh, interest in going back and finding some of those trees. But uh, for the most part, um, non-natives should not be used. We have plenty of native species that attract wildlife. They always have and they always will. Those are the ones we should be using. Uh, and regarding streams, the, the, the phrase riparian areas should be added to areas considered for non-native invasive plant control. And currently, uh, that's not in the draft. And Cali, uh, We'll, when we're doing the question and answer, Kelly may want to pipe in uh, about any of that um, because she is uh, one of our water experts. Uh, now, that is actually the end of my very short show because uh, the non-native invasive plant part of the whole forest plan is a, is a pretty small part in space, but it is ecologically one of the biggest parts of the whole plan. And if we took those uh, steps to uh, um, perform those, put those recommendations, if the Forest Service will put those recommendations into the plan, we will have something to work from uh, to actually uh, budget for and um, uh, focus on for the next 20 years. And I know that there's a whole group of partners and organizations and young people who are educated in non-native invasive control and coming along that would be more than happy to take part in that kind of work. Um, we are at 6.06, .06 and we go to what time? 6.30, is it, uh, Susan? Yes, 6.30 would be a full hour. So it would be great, I think, to take some questions and then maybe do the bonus slides that you have. Yeah, let's do that. I'm all set for it, and I'll turn it over to uh, Callie. Okay, Bob. So we got a couple of questions. Um, the first one is regarding the non-native plants being allowed to use for wildlife enhancement. So is it just that the plan does not disallow um, that or specifically state that they can't be used or does it actually say in there that they can be used? That's the question. Uh, it, doesn't say, it, I, it doesn't say that they can be used specifically if, I, if, if I've seen everything right, um, but it doesn't prohibit say them. You shouldn't be using them. Absolutely. So, we so that's what we'd like to see. So just to clarify, we're asking people to, to ask the Forest Service to put a statement in the plan that says yes. non-native invasive plants will not be used for wildlife habitat. Great. Yeah, thanks for the Next question is regarding the buffers along roads. Um, and so the question is, are there currently like road, and when, you, and when you say a hundred foot road buffer, I'm assuming you're saying like no timber harvest in that or, um, but the question is, is are there currently buffers along roads that we just want to see wider or is this a new suggestion? Okay, there aren't currently buffers along roads. Um, and again, I'm, sp um, there's two, two issues there. We'd like to see a road budget pro, um, road on maintenance for all roads, but when you're doing a timber project, 
specifically, we would like to see a focus on invasive plant control. And to clarify, they do what's called daylighting along roads. So after after they grow over, trees grow over it, it gets they get they don't they get shady and they stay wet and they cause um, big trucks to make big holes. So they they do what's daylighting. They do do timbering along the sides of the road. Uh, that, we're not opposing that. Um, when when they have uh, these roads, they're going to these stands and they're doing work there. We want them to in their inventory, and if they find non-native invasive plants in those buffers, to then treat them again before the project starts. Got it. Thank you for that clarification. Uh -huh. Okay, um, we've got some more questions coming in. Um, does not does North Carolina have any non-native legislation like many other states? And if not, why not? Yeah, uh, that's a real interesting. It's a good question. It's a real interesting. Uh, North Carolina has a noxious plant list, and the federal government has a noxious uh, weeds list. I guess they call it. Um, and everything that's on the federal list is on the state list. Uh, um, and these are class. Uh, so there's several classes, but you can't plant any not, any plant that's on the federal noxious weeds list. You're not allowed to be planting here in North Carolina. Unfortunately, most of those weeds on that list only grow out in the far west. Right. We're really caught up in the east with these kind of things, and uh, uh, they're ahead. They were ahead of the game out west, and they had fewer landowners and big pieces of land. Whereas here we have tons of homeowners and tons of uh, property rights, you know, for thinking and all that. So it's very difficult to get legislation to actually ban plants. Plus the landscape industry of which I was a part of uh, uh, gets a little defensive when you try to limit things like that. Now, um, to, to just focus a little bit on the way it works, there's a class A list, which they're not allowed to be brought in. There's a class B, uh, I, I mean classification. Class B is if a plant is discovered um, uh, in um, coming in and invading, um, it gets quarantined and uh, they focus on, if they first try to wipe it out, if it first appears somewhere, but if it gets beyond the point where they can really wipe it out, uh, then they quarantine it and they make uh, their prohibited uh, or prohibitions into transporting it across the lines. Uh, again, sort of depending on, um, uh, I don't know all the technical parts in the agriculture department, but depending on the plant and the situation. Now, here's the weird thing. Our, one of our worst enemies, uh, Oriental Bittersweet, uh, was there were a lot of agencies and people asking to have that plant put on the noxious weeds list and banned from sale. And there was a big public hearing here in, the, uh, in Asheville at the Ag Center. Uh, and uh, everybody was for banning it except a little group of four or five nice little old ladies, and uh, they were from Henderson County, and they made wreaths out of Oriental Bittersweet. And those of you that know what happens when you do that, they, they sell them for Christmas wreaths, and then they hang them up on the door, and then after Christmas, uh, they just toss them out in their property behind their house, and three years later, they realize it's the worst mistake they ever made. The birds spread the seeds all around their house, and these vines are strangling all of their trees. Uh, so people, we really wanted to ban that, but these these ladies, sweet as they were, said that we depend on our crafting at Christmas time to sell these to people from Atlanta and New York and Florida. And they had a senator who had a lot of seniority, and he prevailed upon the agricultural department to sort of back off. So they created Class C for Oriental Bittersweet. It's the only plant on it, and. The plant is, a, is banned from being sold and traded across county borders in the Piedmont and the coastal plain, but it is okay to sell it in the mountain counties. And tell me what kind of sense that makes. So end of my opinion, uh, my little editorial there. <laughs> but it's very hard. We, uh, it's actually the best way to get um, uh, action on stopping invasive plants from being sold is really through consumer demand. Uh, um, and I'm, I'm going off on a little tangent on this answer, but it's real important. Everybody that wants to stop invasive plants from being sold should every time they go to a nursery or a, a big box store, um, they should tell the plant manager they, don't, they do not want to buy non-native invasive plants and uh, they won't buy them. And, 
industry gets the message very quickly and they respond to consumer pressure. That actually goes a lot farther than legislation, which often can't even be enforced if it is passed. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll shut up on that one now. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> um, Paul Curtin with Carolina Mountain Club, I'm assuming that's what CMC stands for, is a trail maintenance crew leader. He says, we see lots of invasives like multi multiflora rows along the trail. Do you think we could get approval to use herbicides to address these where we see them? And if so, what would be the approval process to do that? Very good question, Paul. It's Paul, right? Yes. Um, yes, uh, Paul, you, yes, the answer is yes to all of that. Um, it's very simple, actually. Uh, uh, first of all, um, in order to treat invasive plants on either private property where you're getting paid for it or on public lands, um, you need to get licensed and certified with the Department of Agriculture. And it's, it's a very good uh, uh, certification. I've done it and I know I've helped a lot of young people get it. Um, and uh, it teaches safety. That's what they focus on, safety and mixing and in types of herbicides and personal protection equipment uh, and to the ecology. And uh, there are some herbicides that actually can be applied safely and it's also all in how you apply them. Uh, and I don't have time to talk about all that here, but we've been doing it for years and we've been getting rid of these plants. Uh, um, I think it would be great if Carolina Mountain Club leaders that, care, that really have an interest in this were to take the exam, get themselves certified. And the exams are given around the state at different times. You can go on the Department of Agriculture pesticide certification site and find when and where the exams are given. They even have little classes if you want to take them or you can learn this stuff online. Um, but I'll, I'd be happy to talk to you more about that if you email me, um, contact me through our website. My email is there. Okay, the next question is similar. How can volunteers help? Okay, and I, I, I have to add one thing. Uh, after you get certified, you need to uh, contact your whatever uh, um, forest service ranger district you're working in and tell them that you would like to do uh, invasive control. And Gary Kaufman is the uh, uh, um, botanist ecologist for all of North Carolina National Forest and he lives here in the, in the West and I know him very well. He is all for this kind of work. So I think you can get Forest Service approval once you get certified. Um, uh, how do volunteers get involved? I'm sorry, repeat that, Callie. Yeah, how can volunteers help is the question. Okay, volunteers uh, can help greatly. Uh, if if uh, a group of volunteers, again, like the Carolina Mountain Club, or like um, many groups that we've trained, um, and homeowners associations and all, if if one or two of them want to get certified and licensed, they can actually supervise volunteers that are not certified and licensed. Um, it's just a matter of giving them a little uh, training before an, a, a work event day, and um, uh, that's easy to do. And also, uh, the good thing about volunteers is uh, they don't have to. People think you're always spraying with invasives. Most of the work that we have done with volunteers and gotten a lot accomplished is simply using, I wish I'd brought one with me, but it's just a little Kiwi shoe polish bottle with a sponge applicator on it. And uh, it's, it's a little bit smaller than this little hand spray bottle. So it's about that big. Um, and uh, it's easy, uh, uh, it's easy to dispense that. Um, and there are reasons why you want to get that kind of bottle, not just any sponge bottle, because um, many of them leak, but uh, you can uh, give these to volunteers and you simply cut and they're it's mostly woody stem plants you're treating anyway that's what most of our invasive problems are but uh, sometimes you need to spray herbs or grasses but mostly woody stem and uh, volunteers can go out and cut it with pruners a little handsaw a bigger handsaw and cut it at ground level and then just dab the herbicide right on that stump and it will go down in the roots and kill that plant and there are herbicides that will not harm the environment. And um, uh, I won't go into details on that, but that's how volunteers can help. And there are organizations that do look for volunteers to help them. A lot of uh, land trusts that work on their conservation easements, for instance. And Mountain True. You can and Mountain True. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm the, 
fill out the I'm, form and we'll be in touch. <laughs> I've been the proselytizer on this for years. And the good thing for Mountain True is that, I mean, I've been kind of the gung-ho guy in the organization for a lot of years, but when the Hiawassee River Coalition uh, joined with us, uh, Callie and her staff person, Tony, brought an incredible amount of invasive plant expertise and control treatment experience to us, which really helps our far western counties. Um, I'm, so, I'm so happy that happened. Okay, um, another question. This one is really um, not related to, these questions that are coming in now are not really related to the forest plan. So if anybody has more questions related to the forest plan, please go ahead and put those in. And I'm gonna keep on going with the ones that we that we have, um, but uh, you know, just we, we're down to about 10 minutes. So if you have a question related to the forest plan, please go ahead and put it in. Um, Interested in how you and I deal with Japanese knotweed. So just look for specifics on Japanese knotweed. Right. Again, I don't have a lot of time to go into details, but in the, uh, the, the, the most effective thing we found is treating knotweed at the beginning of the growing season, in the middle of the growing season, and at the end of the growing season. It's one plant that you need to simply wear down, and that's treating with an herbicide. Um, and we have found uh, using um, aquatic approved rodeo, you can use that next to streams. Um, uh, and actually it's used for aquatic plants too, but we, we don't go into the water, we, we go right to the edge of it. Uh, but we found that that can slowly wear down the root systems, which go more than three feet deep and, and are prolific. Uh, now, I will say there is a new herbicide out there it's very wildlife friendly, um, and uh, we are testing it, and the Forest Service is testing it, and it's too early. We've only been testing it for us for a year and the Forest Service now for two years, but the results have been incredibly much better than uh, uh, the rodeo we've been using. And um, until, it's, uh, until we really find it's, it's maybe our silver bullet on Japanese knotweed, um, I won't publicize it in a big way, but if you wanted to uh, talk to me, call me on the phone, I'll give you a little more information about that, uh, uh, what we're doing in, in our, ex our uh, test plots. Okay. Um, how can you get the training to identify non-native invasive plants? Okay, very good. Uh, you could, uh, when COVID is over, if it is, uh, hopefully is over, when we're actually going out doing a lot of volunteer work again on the ground, because we've pulled back on doing anything because of uh, the need for social distancing, but once we uh, reach a point where we're doing that again, joining any volunteer group, mine or our AmeriCorps or Tony Ward's uh, in the West, um, in our Western office, those, those are the people that teach you um, how to do this. And uh, it's very easy. They teach you how to identify the plants. And I'm a botanist. I can tell you, people pick up within the first 30 minutes. They really get good at figuring out the, the plants we're going after that are invasive. And they learn the names. And they realize, they see pretty quickly how different they look from plants that we aren't targeting. So uh, it's really pretty easy to learn these plants. I will also um, uh, suggest, uh, I should have put it on a slide, but there's a great book put out by the Southern Research Station of the Forest Service. Um, and it's a full color field guide uh, with lots of pictures of every, all, all parts of the year of the plant, the seeds, the flowers, the leaves, the stems. And uh, it's just a wonderful um, thing. And it's now, it's available online. Uh, and I, re the name of the book is, uh, it's kind of a long name, but it's basically um, landscape uh, non-native invasive plants of the southeastern states, something like that. Uh, and uh, we could, uh, again, um, if, if you email me, well, I, we may even have it on our website. I've forgotten whether it's on our invasives page, but we can make that available. Um, one more thing that I'll mention while we're on this topic of identifying non-native invasive plants. Um, we have a new series of webinars at Mountain True called Mountain True University. 
And the Western Region Program Coordinator, Tony Ward, recently did a presentation about our top 10 least wanted non-native invasive plants. And it talks about them and has photos. And so I'm about to hit enter on the chat and the link to the YouTube of that presentation is in the chat. So you can go there right now and copy and paste that link if you're interested in watching another 30 minute webinar about non-native invasive plants. And um, that one also recommends um, native alternatives. Okay. That's so awesome. Thank you, Callie. For um, forest plan um, items here, and before I get to the next question, which is a really great one, um, uh, Gary Kaufman is actually on the webinar and he um, wants to chime in to say um, that while he encourages volunteer trail maintainers that are particularly with organized events to treat non-native invasive plants, it needs to be done with caution individually because we also have rare species within some of the trail sites. So basically, you know, when you're on the forest, you really need to be with an organized group that's doing trail maintenance activities or a, a forest service group that's actually treating non-native invasive plants and not kind of going rogue with your little um, dabber herbicide bottle while you're out there hiking around. Right, and uh, that's why I said you have to get permission from the forest service first. Right. That's where that filter would come in. Thank you, Gary, I appreciate you adding that comment. Okay, what are the logistics of commenting on the forest plan? Can you do it through the Mountain True website together with suggested language? Aren't we glad you asked? <laughs> well, you wanna just go ahead and field that, Callie? Yeah, sure. So um, we already on our website have a, and I can put that link or maybe Susan can in the chat. Um, but if you go to the homepage, mountaintrue.org, um, right in the middle of the kind of three features is one that says stand up for Nantahala Pisgah National Forest. And when you click on that, it has a summary of our analysis of the plan. And one of the categories is non-native invasive plants. And then to the right in the sidebar is a blue box that has our recommendation um, associated with each one. And then of course, we do have a comment form um, that you can customize or you can submit the way it is um, that has a lot of those recommendations uh, for uh, the forest plan. And we will um, print those out and deliver them to the forest service. And we've already delivered um, one batch of them so far, but we will make sure that your comment uh, gets to the forest service. If you would prefer to use the forest service portal, um, we have a link to the Forest Service plan page where you can get it straight from the horse's mouth, if you will, and the uh, link to their comment portal is also on that, of course, U.S. Forest Service plan page. So um, there's lots of ways to comment on the plan, and we are happy to help you. And um, any time you have questions, feel free to contact um, any of us about uh, if you need help with your comments. And no, Callie, I'll just jump in real quick. Callie, this is Susan. I'll just add that, uh, again, at the end of this webinar, the browser window that should show up for everybody is that Mountain True webpage with both the analysis and the comment form and the link to the Forest Service page. So that should be helpful. Thank you. Okay. And uh, as I tweaked this presentation uh, continually, um, if there's anything that's not on the website in our recommendations, um, we'll we'll make sure we get them on there. Okay, um, we've had a couple of questions um, related to the use of herbicides. And so I'm just gonna combine them. I'm actually typing answers, but I'm also, but I'm gonna go ahead since we have a, three more minutes, <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead and combine them and ask it live. It's basically around people who refuse to use chemicals and how can we use these chemicals while still protecting the environment. And so if you could just speak to that again about you know the types of things that we're using and how we're actually accomplishing the work so that we're not damaging the environment in the process. Sure I'm going to speak quickly I won't get into uh, herbicides um, but I'm, I want to talk about the um, application and a general thing about herbicides. Uh, the herbicides that you want to use are ones that um, have a very short half-life that is they decompose, they uh, um, break down into lesser um, compounds very quickly and don't harm the ecology. 
Uh, and you also want ones that bind tightly to soil particles. So if somebody accidentally spilled some, it would not move through the ground into a water body. Uh, it would, and if it, if it moved at all ever, it would have broken down long before then. So those are, those are two characteristics uh, of herbicides that, um, that that's one very good um, uh, way of preventing problems. Uh, like I said before, every, it's all about application too. Um, uh, the, 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 the method I described to you is called cut, cut and paint or cut stump treatment. And you're using a very small, tiny bit of herbicide and you're not uh, spreading it all over the environment. When you do spray, uh, would be in a situation where you have a complete monoculture or ground cover and you can't just go along with tiny stems and cut and paint them. But uh, it's, it's, there is so little collateral damage we've found that occurs. Uh, you spray responsibly with uh, like around a 5% uh, concentration. Um, now, if you look at a container bottle of any herbicide, there's a label on there, and the label is actually a whole booklet. It's not just one page. Everything in that label is federal and state law. If you don't follow the directions, you're technically violating the law. As I jokingly tell people, there's not a Department of Ag guy hiding behind the bushes getting ready to arrest you, but uh, we police that ourselves very strongly, and anybody doing any treatment needs to take that seriously and also use the personal protection equipment, PPE. Everybody's learned what that means during COVID now. Uh, we've known about it for years, but uh, uh, simple cautions with protective eyewear, rubber gloves, long sleeves, and uh, clothes, shoes, long pants. Uh, it can get hot on hot days, but you know, you really get used to it. And then at the end of the day, you pull off your shirt and it's like, whoa, boy, feels good. Uh, so personal protection equipment is important. Again, the herbicides that we've used are not going to hurt you if they get on your skin right away or anything but you don't want them to get on your skin and you wanna wash them off if you do. Uh, you wanna protect some from your eyes because uh, one compound actually is like straight bleach. You don't wanna get it in your eye, but you jump into swimming pools that have a whole lot of bleach in them, but that doesn't hurt you. It's all a matter of thresholds. So anyway, uh, and when you spray, you can also adjust a nozzle on a sprayer to be heavier so it doesn't put out a mist and escape and hit something else. You can also use uh, these, uh, what I call uh, compressed Elizabethan collars that ant dogs wear or whatever. Um, they're kind of oval shaped and you can attach that to the end of a wand and spray just on the plant, almost vacuuming the plant kind of, and no, no spray goes anywhere else. Um, so, and also when it, you don't spray on the days that have six to 10 miles an hour of sustained wind forecast. Uh, if, you, if you do on a calm day um, and some days, it, it may be, there could be a 10 mile an hour breeze coming by once every few hours or something, but when you hear it coming through the trees or you feel it, you simply stop. Uh, there's, there's all these common sense re ways of doing it. And if you do these things and follow the label instructions and mixing instructions, we have done this uh, for, oh gee, since 2005. And we've, we've been entrusted by the Fish and Wildlife Service, State Forestry, State Fish, State Wildlife, a forest service to work and conservation uh, land trust nature conservancy to work in areas with federally listed species with chemicals near those species without harming the ecology and we've been doing it and restoring the natural environment in the process it can be done but you do need to use caution and uh, Gary threw out another caution uh, uh, the average person that doesn't recognize rare species I'm a botanist but not everybody is. You don't want to just go willy-nilly treating these things. Did I take up all three and a half minutes? Yep, you took five minutes. So we're at 6.32 and we need to wrap it up, but we're, that is all the questions. So um, Susan, did you want to say anything else before we go? I don't have anything else. Thanks so much, Bob. And thanks again to all you attendees who joined us. This was really valuable. We appreciate yep. it. Look for the survey, please. And <laughs> let us know if you need any help with your comments. And thank you everybody for putting up with my uh, continual barrage of information. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Bob. You did great, Bob. Thanks a bunch. Okay. Bye-bye, everybody.